And another thing that I do sometimes is when I'm looking for like inspiration or reference like in a fashion magazine, what I'll do is like, I'll flip through it. Like I'll take a fashion magazine and I'll do like this, like that. And then whatever hits me yeah. is what I'll get inspired by. So I'm not like, oh, I was inspired by Prada, spring 19. Like it was like, I caught a sleeve of Prada and then it's what informs staple next season, you know? Yeah. So even the creator couldn't figure out where I got my sample from. What's up guys? So a few days ago, you may have seen I uploaded my new episode of 24 Hours With, which is featuring Jeff Staple. One of my favorite videos I think I've ever made, but the only problem is that Jeff and I had this amazing one hour conversation to get all the audio and the end episode ended up only being I think 11 or 12 minutes long. I felt like there was so much value in this conversation that I wanted to just upload the entire thing raw. So this is something a little bit different. I'm calling it 24 hours uncut, which is the raw conversation that Jeff and I had in his office in Midtown Manhattan. I think there's so much knowledge that is packed into this one hour and I'm very confident to say that I think in the same way the first podcast I heard with Jeff, you know, five years ago in Florida. I think this conversation is probably going to impact some people to make dramatic changes in the way they're living their lives. And so I'm really excited to show you guys this and I hope you enjoy it. And leave me a comment with what you think the most valuable thing you learned from this episode is. I'll see you later. So we're not gonna reference the stuff that we've done. Um, no, no, we're definitely gonna talk about it. I guess I was just joking more so that I very much know who you are, but oh, for the okay. sake of audio. You'll ask me stuff that you know the answers to. Yeah, okay. yeah. But starting out, just who are you? What do you do? Uh -huh. What's this? Where are we right now? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am Jeff Staple. I'm the founder of uh, Staple Design, which does um, a couple of different things. Um, it has Staple Pigeon, which is a streetwear apparel line. Um, and then we have a creative agency called Staple Design. Um, and then we also have a lot of retail operations. I used to have a store called Reed Space. I was also involved in Extra Butter. Um, and, uh, and then and on top of those three things, I also do a lot of talks and mentoring and um, you know, lecturing, sort of like the, the talk circuit. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Oh, no, wait, I have, I have a podcast too. I have a podcast <laughs> on, uh, uh, it's called The Business of Hype. It's basically talking to creative entrepreneurs about how they handle their actual business and finances and stuff. Um, so it's pretty much it. What, um, so there was a lot to unpack there. Mm -hmm. I know like it started in design. Do you still consider yourself like a designer at the core? Like what do you, what do you think you are at this point with so many different uh, operations running? At the core, I think I'm still a designer, definitely. Um, I know this because I can't turn off looking at the world as a creative and a designer. Yeah. Whereas um, even though a lot, of my, a lot of my life has morphed into being like a business person, um, I have to turn that switch on. Like I have to get into business mode or like finance mode, okay. you know? Whereas like if I'm on vacation, I'm still looking at like the kerning of the hotel logo that I'm staying <laughs> at, you know? Like yeah. I, I still think like a designer. Um, and I'm happy that, you know, it's still rooted in that craft. And do you still like, are you still like getting your hands dirty, like in the design process as much as you can? Yeah, as much as I can and um, selectively, which is fun. Yeah. Cause you know, like if you have a clothing line and you're making 500 styles a year, you know, inevitably not all 500 are going to be ones that like really resonate directly with me, but I get to work on the ones that really resonate, resonate with me. Yeah. Same with the clients that we have at Staple Design. You know, I, I try to see and touch everything, but I get to really sink in my teeth on like the ones that like I'm very passionate about. Um, and then uh, what's like retail, retail is the same, you know, like I really love doing activations and like physical in real life things at a retail store. I don't really love doing like filling out purchase orders and making sure brands like invoices are paid up and stuff like that. Like I want them to be paid. I just don't like, you know, doing the paperwork of it. So I'm able to like sort of get to a point where I can bring in teams to help me do things that like I don't want to do, you know? Um, and that comes off a little bit like elitist, like, oh, I'm not going to do that. So I'm just going to hire a team. But I think more people should think that way. Like they should not do things that don't make them feel good. Like you should, everyone inherently knows what they like to do and what they don't like to do. Even if they can't 
write it down on a piece of paper, they know the feeling of like when something is fun and joyful and when something's not. And I think the secret to happiness in your life should just be slowly but surely eliminating those things that you don't like to do. You know, and I, I think society tries to put like selfishness on people who eliminate things that they don't want to do, but it's not. It's actually like self care. Yeah. I, I think it's funny, like both the things you want to do and the things that you're naturally good at is probably what even gives you the ability to scale and be able to do as many things as you're doing right now. Like outsourcing the weaker points, you think? I actually think one thing comes with the other. Okay. So, you're passionate about things and you become good at those things because you're passionate about it, you're putting in the hours it requires to get good at those things, yeah. you know? Oh. So I, yeah, I think they go hand in hand. It's not like, oh, well, you're lucky because the things that you love happen to be the things that you're good at. Like they're inseparable in a right. sense, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it was funny, you know, whenever we like, when we were in that first Uber on day one, we were chatting about Nick Auken's podcast. Uh -huh. And you had sort of asked me what like that moment was because as I was thinking back, like, fuck, that podcast was super pivotal and me like jumping and leaving yeah. Florida coming to New York. So I re-listened to it a couple days ago. Uh -huh. I wanted to like get the thing and I think this is kind of a, an interesting jumping off point for us to chat about. Um, there was this one line in particular where you talk about making yourself happy first before you can make anyone else happy. Uh -huh. And there's the line that you say about when you're on a plane and like the oxygen masks yeah. come down, you have to put your mask on first yeah. before you can help anyone else. Right. And I think that was like a weird unlock for me and that I had been living a lot of my life doing what my parents wanted me to do and going to school. Yeah. And that podcast I think was the first time where I was like, all right, like stop everything. Right. Let me do the thing I need to do. Was there something that happened whenever you kind of realized you had to do that? Like, cause I think from what I know of you, like you were sort of doing that, you were going the route of trying to make everyone else happy yeah. and doing the things you were supposed to be doing. Yeah. What was that instance like, do you think that you had to like step away and say, no, I'm gonna focus on me first? Um, there were two instances. Uh, one of them was um, the passing of my high school art teacher, Michael Reed. Um, How was that? That's why I named Reed Space Reed Space. Yeah. So it was while we were in school, like seniors in high school. Um, he was my favorite teacher, the best guy, you know, uh, finished school, finished class, went home, came back to school the next day, and he was dead. And it was because he got into an accident on his motorcycle on the New Jersey Turnpike and was decapitated by like a truck. So it was like instant. And I think like, understanding how you know precious life is and everyone knows that but like when you're that young and you get it like thrown in your face like that especially when it was like the most important figure adult figure in school that it happened to it's like especially difficult um and then the second time it happened was four years into starting staple um i went on a snowboard trip and almost lost my life like slowly, <laughs> I slowly almost lost my life. Um, I don't know, do you want me to go yeah, into yeah. it? Okay, so, I mean, I was, I was in the Andes okay. in South America, yeah. which is pretty extreme. It's like 19,000 foot elevation. Um, and I was with a pack of eight people and I got lost on my own by myself. And I ended up lost for eight hours in like, oh, what essentially is the Sahara Desert of yeah. snow. It's just white out forever like every which way you look it's white you don't even know where the ground or the sky is i was just caught in like a blizzard by myself in the andes with just a snowboard like literally less water than this i had like maybe that much water and i had a cliff bar and that's it right and if i didn't get rescued that evening i would have died for sure i actually literally dug a grave for myself like i dug a hole and laid in it like thinking like this is it. Oh, I legit, no exaggeration, shat my pants. If you wanna know how close I got to death, like I shat my pants. Cause there was one part where I almost like got washed off into like a river. Yeah. <laughs> like the, the, the ice cap broke okay. under my feet and then underneath it was like a raging river that just went off the mountain. And I was holding on for, that's when I shat my pants by the way. <laughs> I didn't just inadvertently, like, <laughs> yeah. casually shit in my pants. Like, I was, like, holding on, pulled myself up, shat my pants. Wow. Yeah. So, 
I get rescued. <laughs> spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! I get rescued, um, and uh, you know, I went back to work, and it was just like, got rescued, went back to New York, <laughs> sat at my desk, and it's like, you know, back then AOL Instant Messenger was a thing, yeah, right, <laughs> and like you know, I logged on my computer, aim, you know, that door sound, and then like ding ding ding, all these things, and it's like, hey bro, what's up? Hey, you're back. So what? you know, there's a deadline for this thing and like, hey, what's going on with this meeting? Da, da, da. And I'm just like, <laughs> I just like pulled myself out of my own grave, you know? And like, yeah. that's when, uh, that was like the most life-changing moment where it was like, I went through like a, a part where like I wanted to shut down Staple then and like, you know, really just like eject out yeah. of like society. Um, but thankfully I was pulled back into some semblance of my regular life. Um, but I did, totally changed my perspective on like, you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. Nothing is guaranteed. And so like within reason, you should try to live every day like it is your last. And I think one of the main reasons why I find myself saying that I'm lucky and that I'm a successful person is because honestly, like if a doctor told you today that like you have one week to live or six months to live, would you be upset and would you change everything or would you be totally content? I don't think many people would be like totally content, but I would be totally content. I feel like I've lived an amazing life that like I have no regrets about, you know? Like I wouldn't like do a lot different if the doctor said you had X number of weeks to live. Yeah. Yeah, like everything I'm doing is what I'm doing. And it's, it's that's a, I realize I say it sort of like flippantly, like that it's just like a thing, but like that's a very difficult way to live your life. You know, and it's, it, it does hark back to putting on the emergency mask first for yourself because you do have to care about yourself first. Yeah. Um, and like I said before, society teaches you that, you know, you have to care about everyone else and you come last. But I just think that's like physically impossible to achieve. Do you think there's any way to, is there any way for anyone to understand that outside of like a near-death experience? Like... I want to start a business that recreates near-death experiences for people <laughs> so that they can understand that. But it's, no, because humans are stupid. Like, we're really fucking stupid mammals. And, like, it's like a dog where, like, the only way you could train them is by, like, hitting them on the nose with, like, yeah. you know, a, 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 like a rolled-up newspaper. And it's, like, same for humans. It's, like, the only way we realize how precious life is and how short our existence is is when we are faced with our own death. You know, and like, no, there's no amount of religion or, or, you know, didactic brow beating that could like ever get you to understand how short and meaningless we all are, you know, in this life. Yeah. We are. We're just dust. It's like it's sad. Does that, um, <laughs> do, you, do you consider yourself like a, like a pretty aggressive risk taker coming out of that? Like, yeah. are you willing to kind of really yep. like throw shit against the wall? Yep. Yeah. Totally. Because, like, what's the worst case scenario is that you're going to die, right? Yeah. <laughs> it ain't going to get worse than the Andes Mountains. Yeah. I always think about that. Like, I remember when, um, very shortly after that experience, I got Reed Space. I started Reed Space, right? Um, and I moved from an office where I was paying $2,000 a month rent for the Staple Design Studio office. It was on Division Street in Chinatown. Um, and I saw Reed Space, wanted to get it. That's another story. But anyway, the rent for read space was 7,500. So like literally I was gonna go from two to 7,500 without a business model or an existing business of read space. It wasn't like read space was the thing making money and I was gonna move it in here. Like read space didn't exist. No one knew what it was gonna do, including myself. And I was about to quadruple my expense. And to pull that trigger, some would say it's like, um, aggressive and like foolish but it's also like i was like yeah how bad could it be like yeah. i might gamble and lose but i'm still breathing and i think it's interesting to talk about sort of what read space was yeah because and you know i've heard you kind of mention it in the past is like now there's like urban outfitters and stuff like that that yeah. kind of mimics a little bit of what read space was yeah. but when read space first was you were building it that was kind of the only thing yeah how did you go about designing what that whole uh, retail experience was going to look like? Um, it was pretty simple, the brief to myself. Yeah. Uh, 
I named the space after my high school art teacher, Michael Reed. So I made the whole store look like a school. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Like I, I imagined um, what my high school library looked like. And I tried to like mimic a lot of those elements, you know, and use a lot of those cues. And not just high school, but all school. So like all the clothes were hanging on this monkey bar system that I used to play on when I was in, you know, like elementary school. Um, there was like these small chairs, which was one there, but like the whole shelving unit was made of like tiny, you know, like uh, preschool chairs. Um, there were school desks for people to sit on. I purposely elevated the cash register so that like when you were paying, you ma made you feel like a little kid, you know? So I did all these little cues, like the floors were stained the same way I remember it. Um, and one trick that I do when I create or design is uh, I try to blur my reference points even to myself. So like I said to myself, I want to be inspired by school, right? My school. But that didn't mean like I went back to my school and got old, old blueprints and I scoured my school and took reference photos and stuff. No, I just want to vaguely remember what my school felt like yeah. and only paint 20% of the picture and let the other 80% be completed by like imagination, right. you know? And another thing that I do sometimes is when I'm looking for like inspiration or reference like in a fashion magazine, what I'll do is like, I'll flip through it. Like I'll take a fashion magazine and I'll do like this, like that. And then whatever hits me yeah. is what I'll get inspired by. So I'm not like, oh, I was inspired by Prada spring 19. Like it was like, I caught a sleeve of Prada and then it's what informs staple next season, you know? Yeah. So even the creator couldn't figure out where I got my sample from. No, that's, and it's funny because like literally my next question was going to be your creative process. Yeah, and I, I flip through fashion magazines really fast. That's my creative process. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure on some level we go deeper than that. Yeah. Um, there, yeah, I could answer that. that the well, other yeah, no, I mean, and yeah, feel free to kind of vamp on that. But yeah. I guess I'm curious, uh, as like I'm doing my research and seeing all the different ways you've touched things with Staple or like the Pigeon, everything's kind of like it's all tied in because obviously it came from you. So there's something that feels similar, mm -hmm. but the, everything like visually kind of bounces around and goes in a lot of different directions. Yeah. And so I'm curious where kind of like the root of your inspiration comes from. Um, the root of my inspiration comes really from like seeing different people from all over the world. I think that's like the secret. Like if you ever hear of like sometimes mom and pop businesses will be like, Oh, I'm starting like a, a cupcake stand and I'll, you know I'm gonna go to the mall and like give people cupcakes to sample and see how they like it that's what I'm doing but on a global level with like lots of different people lots of different countries I'm constantly all over the world meeting people and getting their interpretation or their input and output of street culture skate culture sneaker culture hip-hop fashion graphic design whatever it is food like all of these things the great thing is that street culture is embodied in all of these things. So even if I'm sitting with a chef, I'm getting inspired by that chef, you know? And as I meet all of these different people, I'm basically taking like the biggest survey that's ever been taken, but for myself, you know? Um, and it's, it's direct in the sense that like, I'm not reading like a report of it. I'm getting like soulful insight from people. And I'm constantly absorbing all of that and not in a, like, I'm not even taking notes. I've never taken a note of like someone's observation of something, but I'm absorbing it. And I believe that whenever I create something, it gets put back out. Like whatever I absorb, whether I, like if in the last six months I was in, you know, Las Vegas, Mexico City, Paris, Toronto, LA, uh, Hong Kong, and then I come back and I design a line, there's no way that what you experience could not come out you know, it's like, to me, it's just, just let it happen. It's going to happen. Just don't stop it. And so that's where I get most of my inspiration from is really just like being respectful and considerate of all of these different cultures that I um, meet with uh, and then putting it back out in the product that I make. And I want to clarify when I say respectful and considered, I don't mean like consider it. I don't mean like saying thank you and you're welcome and bowing. I mean like... Be, like consider where you're at. Like if you go to Venice, you can just take the tour and do all the things that like tourists do and follow the tour guide with the flag and just like do that. 
Or you can like stand in an alleyway and watch a baker do his thing and be respectful of his craft and consider what he's doing and why he's doing it versus like looking at this cathedral, which is also is something. But I, the other thing I feel is when, and maybe this is just me, this has to be just the me thing. Whenever like everyone is observing some spectacle, like the Mona Lisa or the Leaning Tower, the Eiffel Tower, right? Like everyone's in awe, just trying to take pictures. You know what I do? I look at everyone's faces for some reason. I always want to see, I'm much more interested in how normal people are reacting to the spectacle than the spectacle itself. I get more inspired by their reactions. So if I'm in a, I hate going to museums because I don't look at the art. I look at people looking at art. <laughs> I think that's way more interesting. Now, if I am able to go to a museum or a gallery on my own and sort of see it in a more private setting, then I could absorb the art in that traditional manner. But I feel like if you go to a foreign country, you're gonna learn more from talking to your taxi driver than you will on a tour guide. I remember someone told me, um, and it was, he was a creative, he was a photographer, um, as like, clarifying why I was making a mistake, was basically saying, um, it's only possible to ever have a 10 year career as a creative, that you would just, wow. you would just fry out after, I after 10 years. in this office that says the same thing to me. Really? Yeah. Okay, and how old? He says to me, <laughs> he says to me Jeff, listen, Staples been around for a while. Brands only last 10 years. You can't expect them to last any longer. It's okay that your brand just fades away. I'm like, what, son? I'm gonna punch <laughs> you in the face right now. <laughs> oh, man. Why? I don't understand why. Why would anyone yeah. begin to think that way? And so that's, I'm, I'm super glad it went that direction. I mean, I assume so now that, how old Staple? 23. 20, 23. <laughs> so I guess obviously, you don't believe that there's only a 10 year span of a brand or creativity. No. But I'm sure at some point maybe there's been lulls of the creative spark not being there as much. How do you think you sort no. of, it's always there? No, that hasn't happened. Okay. There are, there are lulls. Yeah. The lulls happen in the public's reception of Staple. Okay. Yeah, so there's lulls in how quote unquote hot Staple is. Yeah. Right, but my creative spark, no, there's like knock on wood, there's never been like, shit, I'm, 2017 was a bad year, I couldn't think of one t-shirt. <laughs> like I couldn't think of one good thing, like that's never happened. It's, it's, there's always a, a fluid thought process, but the, the process of like getting people to always be excited about your brand is the tough thing. I, and I wanna add that like that 10 year thing that people talk about, I'm not saying trying to do something creative for 10 plus years is smart, I'm saying it's possible. Yeah. It could be foolish, but you know, it's it's a beautiful thing when you've seen a body of work that has encompassed decades of a particular culture, you know. That's a that's a really beautiful thing and I think pff, there's always going to be people that are like, dude, you're old. Like your ideas are old. We need fresh ideas. We need young and I get it. I know. But like there's something to be said for legacy and consistency and longevity. And if an OG can absorb what's happening with like the young crowd, like the up and comers, I feel like that combination, that give back of wisdom with energy mm -hmm. and then energy back in the wisdom yeah. is like, that's a beautiful thing when that happens. Yeah. It can, everyone just can't be like the young buck, you know? For sure. Yeah. You said legacy and I yeah. wanted to talk about that a little bit. Do you think about that, like what you think your legacy will be? And do you have an idea of, I guess my thing is, is it, you know, do you want to be remembered as like this guy who did everything? Is it the pigeon dunk? Like what, like what's, what do you want attached to your name when you're gone? Have you ever thought about that? No, I th I've thought about not thinking about it. Okay. But I haven't thought about what my legacy will be. I don't want to think about that. What I want to do is think about I guess it's, maybe it's, it's the same, but it's different. Like, I care about what staple will mean to people when I'm gone, but I don't care about my, like, Jeff Staples okay. legacy in the industry. Interesting. Yeah, and I think one of the things that I try to do is really make the work about the process of the work versus 
some arbitrary finish line of like, once I've done that, then everyone in the headlines will say, Jeff was known for this, that, and the third. Like, I, that's the two realities, right? It's like, one is like thinking about when you die, what your obituary would say. And then the other one is thinking about what you have to do at 4.25 p.m. today. Those are two very different things, right? And if you go back to Michael Reed passing and my snowboarding accident, like why think about the obituary head? Like, like that could come today. The headline could be written tonight, potentially. So you're gonna spend the next 30 years trying to craft this thing that like you don't know when or how it's gonna come. It's crazy. The only thing that you can be responsible for is what's happening right now and immediately next, right? So I'm always trying to disassociate myself with thinking about that future and just focusing on the, the now process. And if, there's, if that's the case, if there's any legacy that I want is for people to be like, Jeff only cared about the now, <laughs> like, then it's fine because that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. And when I say disassociate, I'm, I'm saying like, Society and press and social media and like peers, you know, almost every interv interview I do, they say like, what's the five year plan? What are you gonna do in five years? Like, and I always try to, it's easy to fall into the trap of like thinking about planning the future and long-term outcomes. It's hard to just sit in the now. That's really hard to do. Cause the now feels easy for people and the future feels challenging it feels like hard mm -hmm. but actually being at rest with yourself in the now is really challenging and most people aren't there and going back to the face mask on the plane thing if you're not at rest now I guarantee you you will have a very hard time being at rest in five years too you know yeah that was good <laughs> <laughs> um I want to talk a little bit about... I like when I say things that I've never said in an interview before. Yeah. I've never said that before. I want to talk a little bit about uh, staple design mm -hmm. and um, your process for taking on projects. Because I'm sure at this point, like, there's just so much inbound. Yeah. Um, do you have any kind of, like, checklist, like, mentally that you're going through of what you say yes and no to? Mm. And before even that, do you default into saying yes to everything or are you more of a no person? I'm more of a yes person. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely more of a yes person. Um, I love that question because I know a lot of my friends are like default no people and you have to like coerce them into saying yes. Really? Yeah. Because so, I, I'm a heavy yes person. Okay. To a fault. Yeah. Like I actually think I need to start saying no far more. Yeah, me too. I do too. But it's inbred in me. It's fucking, it comes from, for me, it comes from being like a minority and, a, and like an immigrant, a, a child of an immigrant family. Yeah. And like, you know, when growing up, you know, we were like middle class. We weren't like poverty, mm -hmm. but there was also this notion of like not really knowing if like we would be living here in like a month. You know, oh, and yeah. like yeah. kind of check to check. My parents are both entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. They didn't work for anybody. So like when they, if and when they ever stopped working, money would stop coming in. So there was always that idea, like very right. close to reality. And so I think that's why like my default is yes, because I always have this fear that that will be the last person that ever calls me. So I better say yes to it. Yeah. You know, I still like, if I see a penny on the floor, I still pick it up because it's fucking money. Right. You know, and like, it's like when I see, um, I see like little old ladies going through like the trash bin. Yeah. I'm like, that is, that's a dope ass hustle. Like <laughs> every, every time I look at a trash bin, I, I think like there's like a dollar fifty in there if you just yeah. get your hands dirty. And, and that's, you know, it's, I, like, I'm like, yes, I get why they do that. Yeah. It's just literally money and trash that you just gotta go get. Yeah. Um, so I'm a default yes person. Uh, I, I try to say no now, um, I've learned and this is kind of getting into the weeds of things, but like one of the things that you have to learn as a creative and especially as a business owner is like learning your rate, yeah. right? And like understanding what your worth is. And, you know, it's not so much about saying no, it's more about knowing your worth. And if the person on the other side of the table doesn't see value in that amount, then it's a good reason to not do the project. And one thing that I think 
has helped in, in allowing me to sustain for so long is that I don't take shit personally. Yeah. Like, I'm not like, I'm worth this, you motherfucker. Like, do you know who you're talking to? Like, I'm just like, oh, this is what I f- would do this project for. Yeah. Your budget's X? Oh, that's fine. Call me when your budget's Y. Like, and then we'll, we'll have a great time then. It's nothing personal. It's yeah. math. You have this much. I want this much. We're, we'll try to do this. Yeah. If we can't, then it's cool. Like, yeah. no one's wrong in this situation, sure. right? You have your number, I have my number. There's no one wrong. And I think people, when I, I've said that to clients, like, and I'll be like, oh, and by the way, where you want to be, I have seven friends that will do it for that number that are super talented. Here's their phone number, call them. I don't even need yeah. anything. And they're just like, huh? Like, did you just tell us you didn't want to do this job and gave it to like other people, you know? But I think that's why we've been able to sustain because it's just like, the business and, and the creativity side, or the, you just have to see them as two different things without yeah. ego. You can't well, it's, get- It's just like not being emotional. Like yeah. there's taking like the emotion out of it, which totally. I think from like the creatives I talk to is inherently tough because creativity so tough. is an emotional thing. Yes, you know? but you have to figure out, you have to treat it like if you're trying to get gas, and there's four gas stations on each corner, and you're like, oh, there's 229 a gallon, 225 a gallon, 230 a gallon. Like, some people are just going for the cheapest gas station. Yeah. I'm going there, they, they're three cents more, but their mart has better snacks in it. And I like that the people wash your windows yeah. and they have towels there. I'm gonna pay for that. It's your prerogative, it's fine. You, can, <laughs> you know, there's no wrong answer there. Like, what, what do you kind of feel about the current state of street culture, sneakers, things like that? And I mean it in the sense that um, it's never been as popular mm-hmm. and mainstream as it is right now. Correct. But also, you know, we could open up your laptop, come up with a name and have a brand yeah. in 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. What, like, we, could have a, you, we could have a store in 30 minutes. Uh, we, we could. Like, <laughs> do you like that it's become that easy? Or is there, there uh, part of it that's like... It's, I'm indifferent to the, to the ease of entry now. Yeah. Um, there's, I've thought about it a lot, and there's equal amounts of good and bad. Okay. The good is that for every thousand kids who start a brand today, one of them will be the next Jeff Staple. One of them will be the next Jerry Lorenzo and the next Virgil Abloh, right? The, the downside of it, of course, is that 999 of them will fail and they'll be disappointed. And that's the sad part. Um, but 20 years ago, that one kid that becomes the next Jeff or Virgil doesn't even have the access or ability to do it. You know, like they don't have the tools to do it. They'd have to go to Parsons School of Design and go get into $80,000 in debt. Like it would just be a non-starter to even be able to do that. And so then we lose that person in our world, you know? Um, So I like that there's an open democratic way of getting into the culture. Mm -hmm. I don't like that there's so much out there, but I do also think that the ones who aren't true to it and the ones who don't bring anything new, they sort of fall away really quickly. So there's like a self process of elimination that happens you know um and i think the elimination process is also a beautiful thing like i you know there's like a a pruning of the culture that occurs which i i really like what um what do you think is sort of like core is it just being able to like keep your head above water for that amount of time or is there there's something that you think really sets people apart and the Um, one that succeeds the way I see it, it's like, it's almost like an equalizer and there's different dials, okay? And for some people, success, like success and being able to sustain a business and like have, you know, um, the other thing is like, what is success? I think you have, first you have to answer that, right? So if you take the normal terms of success, like, oh, lots of people respect, like, and know this thing that they've created and they're able to employ lots of lives and themselves and they're not hurting anybody, that's a successful thing. So let's start there. Um, But if you look at it that way, the equalizer dials that are needed to get to that point are varied and you can have, you could be cranked up on one and like zero on the others and you can make it. Or you could be balanced and you can make it, you know, you could be cranked up on this one and zero on this one. So there's a lot of factors involved. There's like, I'll give you one example. 
if you come from a super fucking rich family, you're probably gonna make it. Yeah. Let's dial that one up all the way. And like, you could have no talent, no drive, no consistency, but if you have unlimited source of income, you'll probably have a good chance of making it. Right. Here's another one. If you're really beautiful, you'll make it. Because we live in that kind of a society yeah. where like beautiful people get lauded, right? You could be, you could have no money, medium talent, but be the hardest working in the hardest, oh, let me say that again. You could be, have no money, medium talent, and be the hardest working person in the room, mm -hmm. you have a good chance of making it. Yeah. Yeah. And my stance was always, always that I will hold my breath the longest underwater. That's, that was my thing. Even as a kid, I legit did that. Like I would impress people by how long I could hold my breath underwater. Right. Like I think I could go like three minutes underwater. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that I would do is you know in high school and middle school like you play arm wrestling in the yeah. in the in the cafeteria my whole thing is when i arm wrestle kids i i could rarely beat a kid but this way no one could get my hand down like i could stay in this position like you're and you're on top i could just stay there yeah. for hours until your whole shit crimps and then when you're done i just slowly do that yeah and so it's like i would just <laughs> i'll just sit in the pocket and just chill and like wait for everyone else to fall away. And, I, and that's part of the reason why I named the brand Staple. Like I'm just a raw You're essential there. element that you can't live without and that's it. But I'm not gonna like out bling you. I'm not gonna outspend you. I'm not gonna out beautify you, you know, but I will just always be there. I'm like that annoying fucking thing that just never leaves. Um, and that's been always my MO going in because when I started in this culture, like I saw all the other people, you know, all the other players and everyone had their thing. Like there's the beautiful guy, there's the beautiful girl, there's the champagne bottle opener, there's the spin and rim guy, there's the bling guy, um, there's the guy who promotes parties really well, there's the guy who like brags about himself really well, you know, and I, I saw all of that and I was like, all right, I'm not going to out promote him, be more beautiful, like I'm never going to have that guy's money, but I was like, I can do this. And so I was just like, I'm gonna do that for, for Staple. I think a lot of people can relate to that because a lot of people, I always mention high school because to me, like high school is a microcosm for life. Mm -hmm. But like most people in high school are not the prom queen and the, the starting quarterback. Yeah. Most people are regular people who are just chilling in the parking lot, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's how most of high school is. And it's like my strategy for how I built my company and my life is that I was super duper average. I'm not the phenom at all. My, check my SAT scores, check my GPA, it proves it, you know? I was a 2.0, I got a 1,000 on the fucking SATs. <laughs> I got a 550 in English, 550 in math, you know? Very, very average. But I think a lot of people can relate to like, I can't overly impress a lot, but I can sustain, I can do that. And if you sustain, if you're a black belt level at like consistency and holding it together, you can really make it. It's gonna take longer, you know, because you know, you're not Bieber, you know, but like, so you're, it's gonna take longer, but like, if you can get yourself to love the process of doing it, then it doesn't really matter how long it takes. You're just gonna have like a dope life. Yeah. yeah. No, I like that. And I think, I think there's something to be said for like, the quicker it comes, the faster it goes. Like how many people have been like the overnight success that yeah. we never talk about. And then there's, there's the phenoms, you know what I mean? Like I've been blessed to, to build a brand where like I cross paths with a lot of talented people. And man, I tell you, when I sit across the table from like talent, pure raw talent, it's incredible. It's like, wow, this person is like, magic like a genie in a bottle you know and it's just like you your your hair stand up because they're in the room you know they have this presence but like it's funny they're always like there's this mutual level of like man i wish i could just put like all the thoughts in my head together jeff like you did and like create something that meant something for a long time because i'm so like like all over the place like my head is fireworks 24 7 you know so like there's this nice give and take but like yeah i don't have that i don't have that pure talent you know i'm not tiger woods i'm not michael jordan like yeah uh i told myself like from the second i reached out to you that i yeah. wasn't going to ask a question about the pigeon dunk okay and then don't as i it. was walking in 
it's everyone's heard the pigeon dunk story, right? I'm curious what happened after that. Um, <laughs> going from like such a high level kind of explosive thing. I can't what wait was to tell like you. Walking back into the office Monday morning. I can't tell you what happened the day after the pigeon dunk. Okay. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. The pigeon dunk was not an overnight smash hit success. Okay. The pigeon dunk was what we just talked about. Like the thing that every year, trust me, I swear on my mother's life, I have never spent one dollar of marketing to tell the pigeon story. It gets told by the culture. It's folklore. It's like, you know, an orator telling like an old mythological story. It just keeps getting retold and retold. And in the first days, first years even, post pigeon dunk, it was like, oh yeah, that was a good shoe. Like it's got some resell, whatever, yeah. you know. We're talking now like 15 years later and people still like write cover, art, cover page articles about the pigeon dung. And it's amazing, but it just goes back to the consistency thing. It's like, it wasn't just this like one shoe and it's like the sneaker head in me, the real sneaker connoisseur in me like feels almost bad about like other releases that happen that don't get the same longevity as the pigeon dunk do. Yeah. Like I feel legit bad like that. Like they released the Marty McFly Back to the Future shoes that have auto lacing yeah. in like this plutonium box that like, you know, Doc used. Nobody talks about that anymore. Right. I'm like, what? You know, like, <laughs> like it's crazy to me. Like, yeah, I mean, I can't think of any other examples off the top of my head, but there's been like some amazing fucking releases, yeah. but they just keep talking about the pigeon dung. So it's like, it's awesome. It's a gift and a curse because I think a lot of, um, when you create, I'll say this again, like when you create something that means that much to any culture, whether it's music or street culture, steam culture, then you tend to get <laughs> pigeonholed. I'm sorry, there's no other word for it. You tend to get pigeonholed into like, oh, you're the guy that did that. And so that's it. So honestly, a lot of my effort in storytelling is spent proving to people that I'm not just the guy who made the pigeon dunk, you know? Um, and, you know, when young people just get into the culture, I can imagine, like, you get into sneakers, you start Googling, like, why are people reselling? How did sneaker culture start? I guarantee you Pigeon Dunk will be in the first page of that Google result sheet, right? And so you look into a little bit of, like, okay, who's the guy who did it? Jeff Staple, okay, cool. Now you're just the guy that did this one shoe. But, like, when I've done all this other stuff, it's hard to be the guy that does all these other things equally well too you know it's it's hard to justify and prove to people that that might actually be the reality yeah yeah and i guess sort of that ties us all together into like the loving the actual process and the patience of it is it's like now you kind of just have the rest of your career that you're building yeah i mean it 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 goes into that for sure um overarchingly the process of trying to just show people what like I'm made of in a sense. I have, it's a great Jay-Z line. He says, I've got nothing but time. It's fine. Like I could do this forever, you know? So like I'm in no rush. Um, but yeah, it's like, uh, there is a, there's definitely a chip on my shoulder when I hear people say like, you just did the pigeon dunk. Like you did nothing else since then, you know? Yeah. And I have a chip on my shoulder, but it's also like, I don't blame the person saying it to me. I actually redirect the energy. I, I will admit, there was a time where I was like, fuck you, punk, right? <laughs> like, I definitely blame the person, but I've redirected the energy now back to myself to say, Jeff, you're not doing a good enough job educating these people on what you do. Like, you need to work harder to show the world that you're not just the guy that did the pigeon dunk. Yeah. You know? What would you do if everything went away. You couldn't do design and clothing and all those things. What would, yeah. it, what would next day be like for you? I would, actually, I really look forward to like driving Ubers. <laughs> I would really, <laughs> I would love to drive Ubers. I would okay. kill it. You should hear the conversations I have with Uber drivers. 
No, I believe. I'm like, bro. I'm like, first we should. I'm like, like that series do you <laughs> do you work night shift or day shift? Oh, I like to work the day shift. I'm like, yeah, but isn't night shift better because like you have less traffic? Yes, but less customers. I'm like, yeah, but I think may, like I would sit there and just hack my way through Uber to try to figure out like yeah. the most optimal time to work. I'd interview, I'd make a podcast about people I picked up in the Uber. You know, I would just do like 10 minute interviews with people. I'd have a mic hanging out the back in a release form yeah. on a clipboard. I would love to, I, I just feel like I can really, um, I can, <laughs> I hate, I'm trying to figure out a way to say this does not sound pompous, but like, I really think I could make a, <laughs> I'm trying to think, let me see. <laughs> I'm really, okay, I'll just say it. I really think I can make millions like doing anything. Okay. Because the thing I will choose to do will like, if I drive Ubers, I'll be the first millionaire Uber driver. Because <laughs> I will hack the system and figure I'll, I'll it out. A little bit though, like... Because, yeah, I know it requires unpacking. But like, yeah, I just feel like everything I do, I do to the fullest. Okay. That's what it is. Yeah, I take pride in everything that I do. And it's not, it's, Someone's gonna say like, yeah, you take pride in working with Nike and hanging out with Hiroshi Fujiwara. Of course, like, I would take pride in that too, son. I'm flipping burgers at Chick-fil-A, you know? Like, no, but I would take pride in flipping burgers at Chick-fil-A too. Like, yeah. I would take pride in driving Uber. I would take pride in like anything that I do. And I, I almost in some strange sadistic way want to do that <laughs> to like show like, look, I just drove Uber for two years. And like I killed it, yeah. but they're gonna be like it's because you had a huge, huge Instagram following. That's why you like you, you got you got more rides. So it's like I'm trying to like just you know really uh, level the playing field. And I just really I just want to show you know young people that are just like trying to figure out their identity and figure out what they want to do that like it's right there. It's right there in front of you. And I have friends, I have family members that are like really close to me that haven't figured out what they want to do. Yeah. And it's, it's hard to watch because it's like, it's so strange to me that they can't just look in the mirror and be like, what do you want to do? In this day and age, that could literally be anything. Like if you were like, I want to be, I just want to play video games 24 seven. You can make a living doing that now. Yeah. You know, I want to uh, garden. I follow this gardener on Instagram, he's huge. He just shows people how to water his plants. Like, <laughs> like you can literally say anything and you can make a living. So, and I'm, I'm cautious to not sound like I'm shaming people, but it's like, honestly, you can't look in the mirror and be like, what do you want? What is the thing that you can't stop thinking about doing? Like, honestly, even if it's sleeping, you might be able to find the living being an expert sleeper. <laughs> <laughs> like, you could be a sleep expert, <laughs> you know? Like, I just think, like, it's out there, and it's like you're just making an excuse for yourself when you say, I don't know what my passion is. Like, that's, that's like saying, like, I don't know if I like burgers or chicken. Like, what do you mean? Put it in your mouth. Tell me which one you like better, you know? Yeah. That's great, man. <laughs> All right. Cool. Perfect. I don't know if we should end it on that sentence, but like... I, 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 know, I know the sentence I want to end it on. <laughs> Burgers or chicken?